Hi, I'm John Stevenson, and we're going to be looking at Isaiah chapter 39 in our continuing study of the Old Testament prophets. Recently, we've looked at the invasion of the Assyrians. This was in chapter 36 and 37 of Isaiah. Next, we had the story of Hezekiah's illness, where he's told he's going to die. And and instead, after he prays, God gives him an additional 15 years. He's just come out of that as we come to chapter 39, where he has a visit, sort of a get well visit, we could call it, from the king of Babylon. Chapter 39, verse 1, at that time, Merodach Baladan, the son of Baladan, king of Babylon, sent letters and a present to Hezekiah, for he heard that he had been sick and had recovered. Now, we have to back up and and talk a bit about Merodach Baladan. He hasn't yet been seen here in the book of Isaiah. Uh, His name means Marduk has given a son. Marduk was the the pagan king of Babylon, I'm sorry, pagan god of Babylon. Uh, he's also known as Marduk uh, Apla Edina. Uh, he probably had a number of other names too. Kings often did have a number of different names. And he took the throne of Babylon when Sargon II became king. Uh, Sargon II was the king of Assyria. Now, Babylon in his day was not a great empire like it would be eventually. Right now, the major empire in the world was the Assyrian Empire, and Sargon II, uh, his brother, at least he said it was his brother who died, uh, Shalmaneser V had died in uh, 721 BC while he was besieging and trying to take the city of Samaria, who was going to take the, the northern kingdom of Israel into captivity. That king died, and Sargon II, who said, oh, I'm his younger brother. Now, whether he was or not, I'm not going to argue, because I don't know. I wasn't there. Uh, I don't have any DNA tests. Uh, some people have doubted that, um, especially when they looked at his name. Sargon means legitimate prince. And when you name yourself legitimate prince, you have to wonder, well, are you? Uh, but Sargon II became king. And at the same time, Merodak Baladan took the opportunity to take over Babylon for himself. Now, here's you see on the map, you see Babylon, the Assyrian Empire to the north. And, of course, he did that without the permission of the Assyrians. And so he did that by making an alliance with Elam. Elam was Assyria's, their foe in the east. Uh, And so he allied himself with Elam. And for the next 10 years, he ruled as king of Babylon. Now, he's eventually driven from Babylon by Sargon II, uh, only to return when Sargon II dies. He, he, he's, he's driven away. He comes back for a brief time. And Sennacherib, the same Sennacherib that we re- uh, read about in, in Isaiah 36 and 37, the Assyrian king who tried to take the southern kingdom of Judah, Sennacherib returns and drives him uh, again from Babylon, uh, again he runs down to Elam and finds sanctuary there. And Sennacherib actually tries to chase him down all the way to, to Elam. Um, and so he ends up taking residence in Elam, and he tries to, uh, Sennacherib tries to capture him, never does. Um, and so that's sort of the, the, the history of Merodach Baladan. Now, the story here, at that time Merodach Baladan, son of Baladan, king of Babylon, this seems to be... Because remember, we said that uh, Isaiah 36 and 37 don't necessarily come before the action of chapter 38 and 39. It might be a chron- it might be a topical arrangement instead of a chronological arrangement. And if that's true, then maybe this is during that 10-year period where he's king of Babylon. Um, he's, he's still against the king of Assyria, but the king of Assyria has bigger things on his plate. He just hasn't made it down to, to drive uh, Merodach Baladan away. And he hears that Hezekiah has been sick, and he sends him a present. He is trying to enlist Hezekiah's assistance in a union, in a confederation against those nasty old Assyrians. That's the the background of what seems to be happening. That's sort of the the political uh, background to set the stage. Verse 2, Hezekiah was pleased and showed them all his treasure house. Now, who he's showing are these envoys from Merodach Baladan, these envoys from, from Babylon. And perhaps he thought of himself as being a little bit like, remember how Solomon 
was king and had a magnificent temple and a magnificent palace. And the queen of Sheba had come to visit him. And he had shown her all these grandiose things, and she had responded in faith. Now, I can't help but wonder, was Hezekiah pleased with himself? Was he pleased with God? Notice what he's pleased. Uh, and showed them all his treasure house, the silver and the gold and the spices and the precious oil and his whole armory and all that was found in his treasuries. There was nothing in his house nor in all his domain that Hezekiah did not show them. Now, I'm not saying Hezekiah took them into the, like the holy, holy, holy of holies in the temple, but maybe did the outside of the temple and, show, and showed him all of these things, but especially in his own treasure house, which makes me wonder, is he boasting in God or is there a little bit of boast in himself? And my answer is, I don't know. I don't want to say, I don't want to pass judgment because I can't really tell. But verse 3, then Isaiah the prophet came to King Hezekiah and said, what did these men say and from where have they come to you? And Hezekiah, he's not trying to hide it. He says, they've come to me from a far country, uh, uh, this country, Babylon. By the way, the way you say Babylon in Hebrew, you say Babel. Remember how you have uh, the Tower of Babel? This is the same place. Uh, for some reason, when we get to the, our English translation, here they've translated it Babylon instead of Babel. But the Hebrew says Babel. They've come to me from, from this far country, from Babel, the place we know is Babylon. Verse 4, he said, what have they seen in your house? So Hezekiah answered, they've seen all that is in my house. There's nothing among my treasuries that I have not shown them. Then Isaiah said to Hezekiah, hear the word of the Lord of hosts. Behold, the days are coming when all that is in your house and all that your fathers have laid up in store to this day will be carried to Babylon. Nothing will be left, says the Lord. God says there's coming a day when there's going to be a Babylonian captivity. Now, that's not going to happen in Hezekiah's day. It's going to happen quite a bit in the future. But it will happen, and that's what is being prophesied right here. Verse 7, and some of your sons who will issue from you, whom you will beget, will be taken away, and they will become officials in the palace of the king of Babylon. They will be taken away. Now, when it says they will become officials, is that a good thing or is that a bad thing? The fact that the people are taken away, that's, that's not going to be good. That's going to be ju the judgment of God. Um, that, but the fact that they will become officials, maybe that's, uh, on the other hand, they're going to be able to influence this far off place. And that, that's that's perhaps a caveat. Uh, might be seen as good, might be seen as not so good, uh, because they won't be ruling anymore in this place because there's going to be a Babylonian captivity and everything's going to be taken away. Now, verse 8, we see Hezekiah's response. And the, the chapter and the entire section of Isaiah closes on this note. Then Hezekiah said to Isaiah, the word of the Lord, which you have spoken, is good. You say, well, that didn't sound all that great. The fact that you're being taken into captivity, the fact that all the treasures that are here in your house will be taken to a pagan land, even that your sons will be officials. Maybe that's a little bit of an upside, but they won't be officials here. They'll be officials in this foreign country. And then we have the explanation which was going on behind his words, for he thought, and here it is, for there will be peace and truth in my days. And you say, well, okay, that's nice for your days. What about the days that are to come? And, and, and remember, at this point in the book of Isaiah, we've had an entire 38 chapters leading up to chapter 39, 38 chapters that were largely chapters of judgment and woe, and and judgment at the hands of the Assyrians, but not only the Assyrians. There have been there have already been references to Babylon earlier in Isaiah's book. But he says there'll there'll be peace and truth in my days. And I have to pause because we live in a day right now where, relatively speaking, there is peace and truth. And you say, well, gee, it doesn't. I mean, there's a lot of lies going on. Um, when I read the newspaper, there's not all that much peace. That's why I said, relatively speaking, after all, uh, both in ancient history and, and even in modern history, in the last hundred years, there have been terrible wars where there were literally millions of people 
that died horrendous deaths. There have been millions and millions of people dying in in warfare, in (laughs) non-peace, in in very unpeaceful situations. And also in the past, if you go back to the ancient world, uh, there were there were lots and lots of people who died who had no access to the truth. And yet we live in a day that is after the cross, where Jesus has come, where he, uh, he, he lived and he died and was buried and rose again. And ever since that day, the gospel has gone forth, the good news has gone forth, that people can come to the Lord, they can repent and turn to him in faith, and they can believe the good news and they can find refuge, they can find safety, they can find, can I say it this way, they can find peace and truth in him. And we live in the day right now where it's still possible to come to the Lord, to to hear that message of peace and truth, and to come to him. But there's coming a day when judgment's going to come. And when that final day of judgment comes, it will be too late to turn to him for peace and truth if you have not already done so. Today is the day of salvation. And the word which is spoken is not just good, it is good news. The way we say that in Greek is we call it the the euangelion, the gospel. That good news is still proclaimed, and you can believe it, and you can trust in him today as your Lord, as your Savior.